do bear with us, the NAB is pretty tricky in here, so hopefully you can hear us all right. Um, I will encourage my fellow panellists to uh, hold the mic pretty close, um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear us all, all right this afternoon. Anyway, thank you for joining our fireside chat um, on the future of subsea. Anyone from North Africa or the Caribbean, huge apologies. If you came here to warm up, the speaker I was saying, there's no fire, so apologies for that. But um, everything else should be uh, per the agenda, which is talking about the futures of subsea. Um, I will let my panelists introduce themselves. So Steve, Antti, um, and Julian, because they'll do a much better job of that than me. So Steve, do you want to kick it? Sure, Steve Alexander, Chief Technology Officer at Siena. Been at the company basically since we started it back in the middle 90s. Today, the team stays in talk. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, Brian Lawrence Strong. They told me that that's the right way to speak to these things. I'm anti component I run the subsea product line management at uh, Infinera. Uh, I joined Infinera in 2008, and we entered the subsea business in early 2009. So we've been the company all through this subsea journey, and I'm looking forward to kind of keeping up with the exponential growth of the capacity demands in the subsea networks. Thanks, Antti. Julian. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Julian Rule, I'm an independent uh, consultant in the submarine uh, area, and I'm also an associate uh, with uh, Cambridge Management Consultants. Um, I help to develop uh, business plans for uh, new submarine cables, uh, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to give a, a different market perspective on this discussion. Super, yeah. thanks very much. We'll try and be pretty punchy because we've got to make up a bit of time here um, this afternoon. So, um, we talk about futures, but if we just spend a minute reflecting back on the past year, if you had one reflection or one highlight in the subsea world in the past year, what would that be? Steve, do you to give you So I think it's the subsea infrastructure, the whole digital infrastructure kept the world going. Without that, it would have been a, you know, more of a disaster than we saw with COVID. But it was that digital infrastructure that we all contributed to, kept it going, kept the world connected, kept the digital economy flourishing. Definitely, thank you. Yeah, I, I hope I can get two reflections. Uh, the one no, none of us want to remember are the uh, supply chain problems we had last year. Uh, we did reasonably well with transponders, but lots of problems with rodents, multiplexers, amplifiers. Uh, looking forward to get rid of all that and, and do a one constraint growth in the, in the coming year. Uh, from my company's point of view, the highlight of the last year was our deployment of the largest ever. Uh, Subsea cable upgrade with more than 100 terabits in more than 20 cable landing sites of the AE1 network. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I've been uh, working uh, out of my home office now for uh, about 20 years, so I didn't even know there was a pandemic on. Um, so, I kept my eye on the market, um, and uh, I think the highlight for me was uh, that the market continued to grow. Uh, and. Um, there's, there's uh, a lot of uh, good perspective for uh, more cables to be built uh, in the industry going forward. Yeah, definitely, thank you. So we're talking about futures. Steve, inevitably in this sort of fireside chat, we will come up against Shannon's law. Um, do you mind, for the non-optical engineers in the audience, just giving us a very quick overview of the simple chats and chats and chats and chats and chats and so that what use, people usually confuse they think it's a number. Like the speed of light is a number you can't even see. Shannon's limit is actually an equation. And the equation relates, um, if you tell me how much bandwidth you've got, and tell me the signal to noise ratio in that bandwidth, I can tell you exactly how much capacity that will carry. It comes in two different pieces of it. There's a linear component, right? You double, you double your bandwidth, you double your capacity. But it also comes with a logarithmic component. Logarithm is unless you're in the kind of Math side of the house. Probably is not very familiar, but you're probably familiar with things that are exponential, right? So exponential means, hey, I, I make it go up by a factor of 10, and it really grows by a factor of 1,000. Logarithm is the exact opposite of that. If I want a factor of 10 improvement, I actually have to make signal to noise ratio increase by a factor of 1,000. In a digital system, it's actually 2 to the 10 for 1,024. So what the DSPs do, right, the, the revolution that occurred, back when we introduced coherent detection, was the application of digital signal processing. That was that game of a thousand to one right there. Right? Immediately everything got better. All sorts of cable 
as he's improved, uh, economic lifetimes expanded, that's fairly mature now. Right? We've done a good job on all the DSPs. Every generation you can expect 10, 15, 20% more, but you're not going to be seeing the tens and hundred X kind of improvements that we've got. The path forward, um, you got to operate the linear space. That means you are adding additional capacity on the individual fiber. That's the rationale why people are looking at CSL band. Or you have more fiber cores. And that's why you have higher fiber count cables, and that's why you have spectral space division multiplexing. Space that's the way forward if we're going to increase the two minutes for the Shannon. Now, the is it's an equation over here. We can pump more power in, we can still do other things to improve it, but it's a law of the dimension. We can only do so much more with the physics. It's brilliant. So we're up against the physics. So to your point, we need better DSPs, more front pairs, SDM, etc. So if we take some of those things, so DSPs first of all. We were talking last week, and I have to confess, I had no idea just the cost and the scale of the effort it took to roll out a new ASP. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, um, Nancy, you know, the cost? And... Yeah, so right now the subsidy industry is enjoying the, the benefit of the terrestrial market. Subsidy is only less than 10% of the total optical. Right? Suppliers like CNN ourselves, we invest heavily in transponders, which, which are made, made by the terrestrial market, but then we put in some secret source into these devices and we can deploy essentially the same devices in subsea. And when we do a complete DSP line module project, we are talking about a $100 million investment. And going forward, the terrestrial is moving towards more and more protocols. And we are facing the prospect that subsea needs to fund a larger part of this investment. So think about the economics, the subsea market, the SLD market, it's about six, seven hundred million dollar market. And if the DSP development costs you a hundred million dollars and the DSP is more and more dedicated to subsea, we obviously have a, have a new dilemma there. So you're gonna there's just no way the transponder price can gain or, or, or keep on having the same same kind of cost trajectory as it has in the past if we need to make these subsea specific investments. So we're not going to see too many new DSPs in the short term then, realistically. Um, it's like like the, what, what we need is more fiber pairs, like Steve just said. And one proposal for getting more fiber pairs is so-called coupled multiple fibers, which the, the benefits are easier splicing potentially more efficient amplification. The downside is that that will require a dedicated DSP. So there's a big question mark on top of the business case for all that. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Um, and, and Steve, you touched on SDM earlier. Julian, just thinking about um, space division multiplexing and physically more fibre pairs. We'll come back to the multi-core, unicore fibre types in a minute, but rolling out more fibre pairs, just give us a sense of what are we seeing there in the market in terms of SDM and more fiber pairs? Yeah, well, um, uh, I think SDM uh, has really uh, shifted uh, the paradigm uh, for the, uh, the market in terms of acquiring capacity, purchasing capacity, um, because uh, you're talking about a cable system which overall is really uh, costing you about the same as it, as it would have done for an eight fiber pair system, but now you've got at least double the number of fiber pairs and, and maybe triple. Uh, and so the cost per fiber pair comes down, and that enfranchises a lot more uh, potential customers buying fiber pairs. Uh, and I think consequently we're also seeing a reduction in uh, the number of people buying managed capacity. Um, so, SDM has been absolutely transformational um, and, and uh, you know, it underpins uh, the capacity market going forward now. Yeah, no, and I mean with Meta Sanjana we've got an NEC system I think with 24 fibre pairs. Is that going to be the new normal? Or are we going to see that raised, do you think? I think from a market perspective, I, I really can't comment on the, the, the technology, although I, you know, um, clearly we are going to need more and bigger systems. Um, and I think you know, from 
the suboptic uh, conference uh, a couple of months ago, it was clear that uh, getting to uh, 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 half petabit uh, systems is certainly within reach. Uh, getting to a, a petabit is going to be a, a, a lot more difficult. Um, I've just done a, a study on the intra-Asia market uh, and uh, my forecast is for uh, a total of, of a petabit of demand by 2028. Now, uh, when you throw in diversity, the need for diversity, uh, the fact that uh, there are many hyperscalers who need many cables, um, I, I think you're, you're really talking about um, the large number of cables being built in, in the next decade. So. Yeah, absolutely. We won't have time to get to it today, but there's the economic impact of that. You know, um, it's going to drive down prices enormously as well. You know, as the capacity is shared. Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing. Uh, at Suboptic, it was very clear, coming from the hyperscalers, that their focus is completely on the cost of the bid. And so, if we're talking about you know increased uh, cost of some of the components, um, you know, there's, as you said, there's a dilemma. Yeah, absolutely. So, coming back to the different fiber types, then, so we can add fiber pairs. Um, we ran out of time to get to it today, but obviously there's some physical constraints with doing that. Cable ships are a certain size, reels are a certain size, you can manufacture a certain size. So you do max out on that physical capacity of what you can lay out against. But thinking about the different fiber types, you're talking about multi core there. What are some of the sort of driving uh, kind of factors, you know, making that more difficult? We touched on the new DSPs and the what are, you, what are your predictions for multi Do you want to see on a little bit? Sure. So I think the, the two that are out there are that is more than multi core, so it's multiple cores with a single And that has the typical manufacturing issues you've associated with it, but Andy talked about was very specialized in this piece to make it work. Um, the other one that is out there that's been talked about is a recent development, it's Hollywood Profile, which was originally developed just for latency issues. But conceptually, it may have lower loss than what you can do with silicon fibers. But I would say for both of these, um, and I'll put one of the quotes, I think they you know, go back to a Bill Gates with them. I think we're going to overestimate what happens within three years and underestimate what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years, right? So I, I don't think it's anything we're going to have to um, plan for over the next, let's say, two, three, four, five years. But it's going to be something we're clearly going to want to keep our eyes on under the five to 10 year time frame. Um, because it is, it's a different way of propagating. Um, they have different characteristics on the similarities. You would build the DSPs in a different way because you can take advantage of the fact that it's going to propagate together. So it is, it's a bit of a different physics experiment. That's good, Nancy. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, uh, in the short term, we're not going to see these, these technologies. In the longer term, we either need to see them or the, the capacity growth cannot continue the way it's going now. And uh, yeah, I agree, the innovation will happen. Very difficult to say today how it will happen and which will be the winning technology. But, but uh, because not, none of these, none of the solutions for getting beyond the 24 fiber pairs, none of them is really fully paid. And, and it's unclear which direction we will take. And, and the economics will be, they will, they will change as well. So this kind of constant, constant decrease of, of price per bit that may be threatened, we will see. Yeah, that makes sense. And Julian, I'm guessing you've not seen too many business case requests for multi-core or holocore yet. Yeah. Not yet, no, no. But I mean, uh, talking to people in the, in the industry, certainly holocore is way out there. Yeah. Um, uh, I think multi-core is something that people are taking quite seriously and, and expecting to see. I think this is a key point uh, that I'd like to make here, is, is that um, to a large extent, the market particularly some of the larger customers, um, they don't care what the technology is, they just want the capacity. Um, and um, you know, they just bang the table until it's provided to them. Um, so you know, uh, I think we have to come up with solutions, whatever, whatever they are, uh, keeping cost but they in mind. One thing uh, that we haven't uh, actually mentioned is uh, C plus L. Yeah. Um, 
and I, you know, I think that is, it's not a, a, an ultimate solution, but it may buy some time. So are you brave enough to describe the difference when you're sat in the same panel as Steve? Or do you want to hand that one over? I mean, he's absolutely right. It's not so basically, basically a double of the capacity. And it's, yeah. it's that linear portion of, you know, Shannon's limit. So we're talking about the double, double your bandwidth, double your capacity, double your fun. And that's out all over C, is that right? Or is it the other way around? C plus L. C plus L. Oh, yeah. Different banks. Um, I'm testing my degree level knowledge from about 30 years ago. Um, good. Let's change gear software quickly. Um, we've seen a huge amount of automation softwareization in the terrestrial world. What are you guys seeing in the subsea world that could drive future efficiency and change, Steve? So there's lots of interest in combining the management of the weapon and drive plan together. So yeah. we have kind of you know, a unified view of the connectivity. Um, lots of interest in what we, we bring is GeoMesh, which is the optical control plane, the layer zero control plane, so it has intelligence and automation you can fail over and route its way through the infrastructure if there is an event, you know, cable gets cut or something other of some kind. The, the whole industry in some sense, um, terrestrial plus subsidy is moving towards a model where certain types of bandwidth become more dynamic because you may want connectivity to a location but you don't need it on all the time at the highest rate. So the model of allowing Kind of flexibility on bandwidth and the model to become more of interest to certain customers. Definitely. Anti, what about you guys? Yeah, in, like in addition to these technologies which enable you to continue the optical paths through the cable landing side to the terrestrial network and, 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 and optimizing the management of this, uh, another aspect is optimizing the capacity itself. Like you can, and, and, and that's one of the areas where we are putting heavy investment, building software solutions which maximize the capacity of every carrier we put into the, into the fire. Because the modeling only goes so far. Uh, then when you really deploy, that's when you can really see which combination of parameters, and we do have hundreds of parameters in the transponders nowadays, which combination delivers the highest capacity. And, and of course you need automated solutions for finding the correct combination. It's too complicated with a manual approach. That's a good challenge, Yeah, I, I think uh, I want to take it a step further and uh, talk about AI. Um, I personally, I'm, I'm very concerned about AI and, and what its potential is, uh, but I think uh, applied in the right way, uh, it can do uh, some, some wonderful things, uh, in particular, as uh, Antti said, optimizing uh, networks and making them more efficient to reduce cost per bit. Um, so uh, that has to be part of the softwareization. It's not just software; it's AI. Absolutely, and you know, AI for our interest in the knock and elsewhere, definitely. Okay, I nearly got us back on track, but not quite. One final thought. So, looking at the year ahead, do you got one prediction or reflection on what you think will happen, be interesting, etc.? Um, please share it now, Steve. Do you mind going? So I think there's another round of uh, upgrades coming. Um, the release of what we're doing in terms of the uh, um, 200 gigawatt modems, it's just the next generation of silicon, leveraging that into the infrastructure. And to um, you know, Anthony's point, you, you have to have a business big enough to support that kind of investment. Um, and we're fortunate we're able to kind of amortize it along with 70,000 of the restaurants to provide so much capacity to protect the infrastructure. So you know, we, we invest on kind of the performance end of it, we also invest on the small handheld plugins because that's the way all this capacity gets distributed out of the edge of the network. And I think, you know, today, we're 400 gig in the palm of my hand, the next generation, kind of from 800 gig in the palm of my hand, to anywhere you want it to be. That's a revolution in terms of connectivity and capacity. And that, that's what's going to feed the suffering systems for the next decade. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a. Uh, like Steve said, what Sienna and Infidera will continue doing is leverage the latest silicon nodes to get power per bit, rise per bit, uh, uh, space per bit down. Uh, the industry, for the moment, will have to scale with more parallel fiber pairs. And then, in the in this five to ten year range, we're going to need some more radical changes in the more in the wet plant side. And then, us transponder guys will, will follow that. I don't know what that change will be. There's multiple options. Very difficult to predict today, to wait. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think on the in, in the short term, um, I guess this is this is a wish list rather than uh, what I think is going to happen. But um, I think we've got to see improvements in uh, power uh, that's provided to these systems. Um, you know, 18 kV has, has been a breakthrough. Um, I think we're going to need to get to at least 21. Uh, longer term. Uh, I've been thinking about the, the whole history of the solar panel industry and how we started with carriers and then we moved into the private uh, entrepreneurial uh, phase and then we went to the hyperscalers. And so there do seem to be cycles of who is actually driving the industry. And uh, I'm wondering who comes after the hyperscalers. Um, my personal view is it's the data center operators. Um, and uh, there are examples of data center operators already getting involved in the carrier market and getting involved in owning submarine cables. Um, what that means for a, a, a discussion like this is that the requirements of the customer are going to change and therefore the technology is probably going to need to change as well. Definitely. It's a good place to end. Um, Steve and TG, thanks ever so much. I um, really appreciate you joining this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, um, and thank you, Andy. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Julian. Uh, and thank you for, for joining us. In two minutes' time, we're going to have a two-hour panel, so please stick around for that.